Ian's Gang, The Bad Ian, by Ian Kidd. Chapter 1. The universe is a very large place. This is because there is only one universe, as opposed to twelve galaxies, solar systems etc. The Milky Way is a galaxy. That galaxy contains only one planet with reasonably intelligent life. Earth. That means we can definitely forget about the Milky Way. Another galaxy is known as the Spiridon Sector, the center of the universe as they know it. As far as this galaxy was concerned, any other galaxies with potential allies, enemies were so far away as to be instantly forgettable. It was just them, and Earth. Therefore, it was just them. Therefore, when someone suggested at the annual intergalactic conference with most major planets in attendance, Zeroth, Zacharia, Kat, and Matadon, though not the deeply religious, and rather amusingly named Bulgaria, that the dump of the universe, Earth, be made aware of its place in the galaxy and play a part in future conferences, it was girlish giggles all round. Strangely enough, the other planet not represented at the conference was the warlike world of Assessis, having been banned since the last conference after they almost caused the biggest war ever seen in the Spiridon sector, until someone realized the star they were all about to go to war over had in fact gone supernova around two million years previously, and as the suggestion came from the fifteen-year-old prince of Zacharia, Ian Williams, fifteen was considered more than adult some of the delegates could be seen having a hernia. The din died down as Ian's father, King Jacob, rose, cast a dark glance at his son and said I think Ian is absolutely correct. Quite so. I agree. Marvelous suggestion. All the delegates who ten seconds earlier had been ridiculing the teenager for his outrageous suggestion were now openly admiring the boy for his intelligence and integrity. What is your full proposal, Ian? King Jacob inquired. Ian looked despairingly around the conference hall. All he'd wanted to do was raise a laugh. The fifteen-year-old king of Zeroth, a planet unique in the universe for many of its inhabitants possessing mind powers, Matthew Parker, reclined in his luxurious leather chair in his suite, sipping champagne and eating caviar. Ah, this is the life, the round-faced chunky, freckled teenager was clearly enjoying his obviously stressful job. There was a knock on the door. Who is it? Matthew called irritably. Robert. Oh, come in then, Matthew grumbled. Robert Stevens, a fifteen-year-old Zerophian who as well as being one of a growing number of people who didn't have mind powers for some mind-boggling biological reason scientists pretended to understand but didn't, was also Matthew's aide and lawyer, entered the room. Tall, fit, dark-haired and usually quiet, he seemed excited about something. Matthew, he began. Your Majesty, Matthew reprimanded. Yeah right, sorry Matthew, Robert continued. That wet Ponce Ian Williams has said Earth should be made a part of the universal structure. He's an out and out moron, isn't he? Matthew said loftily. He's said he could lead some sort of organization on Earth, to make friends, help local law enforcement and generally get them used to the idea of alien life. No idea, has he? Matthew began sucking down his caviar. He's said it could be called Ian's gang. What a little egotist he is. He named some people from various planets who could be in the gang, Robert said. The delegates all agreed to it, and they have to join up no matter what their rank. Ha! Matthew laughed. Go on, read out the lucky victims. Sarah Vasquez, Robert began, Philip Vasquez, her brother. Scott Richardson, those three are all law enforcement officers from CAT. Steve both them from Matadon. That psycho? Matthew looked up. Sheesh, that Ian's in for a shock. Robert Stevens, Robert continued lamely. Matthew stared. You? You? He began to laugh. Oh, Robert. He almost choked, taking orders from that, that. 
Matthew almost fell off his chair. Oh my dear Robert, I'm sure I'll miss you terribly. He tried unsuccessfully to regain his composure. Oh, that's funny. And Matthew Parker, Robert finished coldly. Matthew spat out his caviar. Aaron. In a cold, dark palace on this surface of this desolate, empty world, Lieutenant Michael Stevenson entered his master's office. Julius, sir? Yes, Lieutenant. Julius didn't turn around in his seat, making it seem to the young soldier that he was talking to a lump of unruly dark curly hair protruding from above the chair. Your orders are being carried out to the letter, sir, Michael finished. All the names? Julius questioned. All the names, Michael confirmed. So, this Ian's gang project will not have the chance to begin. You realize, Lieutenant, if it had, Ian would certainly have used it to crush me. He hates me, you know, Julius paused. He's consumed with jealousy. I'm everything he's not intelligent, charming, handsome. You're identical twins, Michael objected. That's what they say. Julius raged. But where's the proof? Where's the proof? Get out, go on, get out. Michael left quickly. I swear on this day, I will have that brother of mine dead at my feet. Chapter 2 Trying to work out how he was going to run an intergalactic peacekeeping force on his allowance and have room left for his weekly carton of strawberry milk, Ian was working quietly on a high-tech computer, not an Apple Macintosh, in his quarters when a noise made him turn, and gasp in shock. Two men, each wearing balaclavas, stood in the doorway. Ian tensed. For all he was slightly overweight and a little bit arrogant, he was also cool, rational and a little bit arrogant, every bit a king's son. The masked man on the left moved in, diving toward the teenager. Sidestepping, Ian threw up his arm, knocking his attacker to the floor, unconscious. Before his masked accomplice could react, Ian kicked him in the groin and delivered a cool right hook to his head. Ian rubbed his hands together in satisfaction as he his two would-be attackers lay dead to the world. On Zeroff, Robert was in his office, dealing with bills, when someone knocked on the door. Robert looked up. Come in. The door opened and two men in balaclavas came through it. Hell. Robert dived for the drawer his gun was in. There was a shot. Robert slumped in his chair. Look Barry. I don't care whether Jim Robber has or hasn't got the hots for Ann Walls, just get up here will you? Ian raged over the communicator. Barry, two men just attacked me. You're supposed to be in charge of security, not watching stupid Matadonian soap operas. He turned off the communicator, fuming down at his unconscious foes. It's never been the same since Mad left, anyway. Robert. Matthew entered his friend's office, and let out an involuntary gasp of surprise. The room was a mess, furniture overturned, papers everywhere. Robert. Matthew reproved thin air, I warned you about those all-night parties, didn't I? Something cracked down on the back of his head. Matthew wondered if the room was meant to spin like that, then blacked out. Robert awoke. He was cold. He sat up, blinking, and discovered to his shock that he was sitting on a beach, the waves from the incoming sea washing over him. Hell, Robert said disgustedly, Matthew warned me about those all-night parties. Quickly, he climbed to his feet and ran on to dry land, which in this case was a green field, which seemed to stretch as far as the eye could see. Robert shook his head. Where the hell was he? The planet cat. Law enforcer Scott Richardson, the toughest 15-year-old on the planet, was on his way home when three masked men leapt out in front of him. Oh, for crying out loud, Scott moaned. I've had a day of this, fellas. Can't you wait until tomorrow at least? The three men advanced menacingly. Come on then, Scott yawned, raising his fists, let's get it over with. The men went for him. 
Scott head butted one thug to the floor, and slammed the other two men's heads together. Scott grinned at his three unconscious opponents. See you in the morning, he called, turning away. There was a loud bang, and Scott hit the ground. Steve Botham could not be described as your average, ordinary, typical, run-of-the-mill Matadonian law enforcer. Put crudely, he was a psychopath. He was a shoot-first, ask-questions-later style cop, but the problem was, once he'd shot, there was nothing left to ask questions to. The fair-haired 15-year-old was a relatively new member of the Armando law enforcement community, yet already he had received 18 reprimands and 16 charges of unnecessarily violent behavior. So why were two men trailing him as he left the station? Ian's frustration was growing by the second when finally there came a knock on the door. Who is it? Barry. About bloody time, too, Ian opened the door, and was immediately punched in the face by one Lieutenant Michael Stevenson. Michael rubbed his hands together smugly. Too easy. Steve became aware of his two pursuers around half a mile down the road, and turned to face them. What do you want? He bellowed. The men drew guns. Shit. Steve yelled, pulling out his faithful friend, and decidedly not standard issue, machine gun, and opening fire, blowing the pair of them away in a hail of blood and bullets. Steve grinned grimly at the carnage. And if my commander calls that unnecessarily violent behavior, I'll shoot the bastard. Matthew awoke. He was cool, but not unpleasantly so. Opening his eyes, he found he was lying in long green grass and, standing up, he saw miles of grass, nothing but grass. Groaning, Matthew decided he'd be better off lying down and going back to sleep. Chapter 3 The Planet Assesses Maximilian Agon, High Commander of the Glorious Assessis Empire, second in command only to President Richter himself, watched as an Assessis warship was loaded with both soldiers and weapons. Alexandro Cesum, Richter's chief of special operations, sauntered toward him curiously. Did we declare war on Zeroff and I just missed the memo? Agon smiled. The warship is going to Eren. Cesum gaped. But why? There's nothing there. It's a husk. There's a few mindless savages, descendants of the convicts we used to put there, see, sand, lots of toxic waste that makes the planet almost uninhabitable, that we put there as well, and a planet load of green grass. There's nothing to conquer. If that's where you're going, you certainly don't need a warship. Agon frowned. But you don't know why we're going, do you? Well, no, Caesar admitted. Then shut up. Agon snapped. Then he smiled again. We are going there to eliminate an enemy of Assessis. Who? Someone who once held the position I do here, Agon continued. Someone we trusted. Someone who betrayed us with his cowardice, leaving an entire platoon to be slaughtered. Someone who is going to suffer for what he did to us. His nickname here was the Badian, he smiled sadistically. Otherwise known as Julius Williams. Ian woke up on a beach. Seeing the tide was coming in, he climbed up a slope onto fields that stretched as far as the eye could see. Hearing a noise, Ian turned to see six men, looking so wild they would have put the wind up earth cave men wearing grass clothes and wielding crude clubs. Grunting, they advanced menacingly upon him. Ian realized he had no weapons and that these men were obviously in no mood for intellectual conversation. One of the men, clearly the leader, he had the biggest dot 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 ahem dot 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 club, raised his arm and pointed at Ian. Ian had the unsavory feeling he was thinking about lunch, turned and ran for his life the pack close on his heels. Ah, brother dearest, Julius the Badian smiled, watching events on a monitor in his palace, a few miles away from Ian's peril. Get out of this one with your ponchon for sucking up to daddy. He laughed harshly. Ian ran wildly. Panting, he realized that. A, he was very unfit. 
B. He couldn't keep this up, and C. The pack quite clearly could. He realized that if something didn't happen soon, he'd end up the main course at a very messy dinner party. Ian saw someone up ahead. Help. Ian cried, waving his arms about desperately. The boy turned and stared at him. Help. Ian cried again. Get down. The boy yelled, get down. Ian dived into the grass. The boy raised his arms in the direction of the pack. The hungry pack leader lunched for Ian. Six bolts of light sprang from the boy's hands, individually striking down each member of the pack. Ian climbed to his feet, brushing himself down as the boy approached. Thanks, Ian smiled, I needed that. So I gathered, the boy said dryly. Don't you know who I am? Should I? For a prince, Ian was clearly ignorant of intergalactic affairs. I am King Matthew of Zeroth, the boy stated pompously. I want a little chat with you, buddy boy. Steve both them entered his house to find it disturbingly dark and quiet. He stretched out a hand to the light switch. An electric shock threw him to the ground, unmoving. Shock reports have been coming in from all of the universe of the disappearance of several of the cosmos finest people, the newsreader stated. The bad Ian was watching the news on his monitor, delighting in his own brilliance. Prince Ian from Zacharia was one of the first to disappear, the newswoman continued. The ruler of Zeroth, Matthew Parker, has also vanished, as his personal aide, Robert Stevens. Implications of a homosexual affair between the two are strongly denied by the palace and were in fact just thought up by us a minute ago for a good laugh. Also missing in curious circumstances are Matt Adams, Steve Botham, and Cats Scott Richardson and Philip and Sarah Vasquez, she paused for breath. Julius smirked. Oh, why am I so perfect? He wondered. And we have just received some terrible news. The newsreader shouted. Julius lazed dreamily. A warship has just taken off from Ursesis and is heading toward the planet Eren. What? Julius jerked his head up. Just what the warship wants on Eren is currently unknown, the newswoman concluded. The smile faded from Julius' face. Chapter 4 The commander of the Ursesis warship currently streaking through space. Nicholas Marnode, a young and relatively inexperienced officer, strolled down the corridors of the vast spacecraft until he found the door he wanted, and knocked. Who is it? A voice emanating from the room demanded irritably. Chief Marnode. The door slid open and Marnode stepped in to see a fat, balding man with an unpleasant look on his face. What do you want? The man snapped. Dr. Bannix. Dr. X. Banix, the scientist reminded him. Quite, Marnode replied. I demand to know where these two high-tech killing machines you promised us are. What do you think they are? Banix indicated two identical humanoid figures standing by the wall. Are they operational? Marnode inquired. If they were, Banix sneered, you'd be dead already. Marnode swallowed nervously. Well they'd better be ready soon, that's all, he went to the door. Or? Oh? Dr. Bannix leered. Marnode turned. Or we'll have to think seriously about whether or not to send you back to Matadon, he smiled. And we all know what's waiting for you the, don't we? Don't push your luck, Marnode, Bannix snarled. You're nobody here. I'm an old hand at this game. Marnode narrowed his eyes. All the more reason for a forced early retirement, wouldn't you say? Ian and Matthew talked somewhat less than amicably as they strolled through the long grass. Their conversation gradually changed from their rampant egos onto what was happening. Well, I would have thought it was obvious, Matthew growled. That Ian's gang idea of yours upset a lot of people. Perhaps someone decided to put a stop to it before it even started. They continued walking along the field that stretched as far as the eye could see. Scott awoke. Climbing to his feet, 
He looked around at his surroundings. He was in some kind of dungeon which, looking around, he could see no exits from dot 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 oh yes, there was one. Oh no it just vanished. Scott glanced around in unease, feeling totally out of his depth. The disappearing door reappeared, and swung open to reveal an inviting corridor someone clearly wanted him to go down. Obstinately, Scott folded his arms. I'm not going anywhere, he told himself, until a massive wind sprung out of nowhere and blew him down the corridor, the door slamming firmly shut behind him. Julius surveyed his movements on a monitor. Excellent, he muttered. The cream of the galaxy's crop, in my domain. In a few hours Assess's soldiers will arrive, and I will leave. But until then, he licked his lips in anticipation, I am going to have some fun with these do-gooding plebs. Robert walked on through the fields. Catching his foot, Robert looked down and cried out, jumping back. Before him lay a rotting corpse, clearly that of a savage that had been half-eaten and left to the mercy of flies. His initial shock over. Robert bent down to examine him. An Aaron resident, he said grimly, but who did this to him? A huge roar from behind him shook the ground with its force. Robert turned and fell back in astonishment. A huge red dragon towered above him, roaring, smoke billowing from huge nostrils. Robert staggered to his feet and ran for his life. Julius viewed all this with a smile. He believes it. He giggled, he believes it. And if he believes one, surely two or three won't make any difference? He began to type on his computer. Robert stopped sharp. Another roaring dragon had just appeared in front of him. Desperate, Robert ran sideways, to face another one. Robert whirled, to find he was now surrounded by dragons. He screamed in terror as the dragons closed in. Robert's screams reached Ian and Matthew up ahead. Turning, they saw the incredible drama unfolding. Robert. Matthew yelled, get down. Robert dived down. Matthew raised his arms. Five beams of light leapt from them and sprang on each individual dragon. The dragons seemed to somehow absorb them, and vanished. Five beams of light rebounded and struck Matthew in the face. Matthew toppled over. Robert leapt to his feet, ran over to Ian and they both looked helplessly down at Matthew. He lay unmoving, smoldering, apparently dead. Chapter 5 Steve woke, alone in a tunnel. He wasn't the slightest bit disconcerted by this, however, he still had his trusty machine gun, and when he came across whoever was behind his current predicament, Checking his gun, he began to walk and it wasn't long before he heard voices, a boy and a girl. Steve raised his machine gun and leapt around the corner, preparing to fire. He heard the girl scream, and heard a shot. He didn't realize he hadn't fired it until he saw his own weapon lying on the floor. The boy who had fired, a small, wiry young man with thick black hair, shoved his gun back into his holster. Good shot, Steve commended. Thank you, the boy grinned. I'm Philip Vasquez. Steve both them. Sarah Vasquez, the girl spoke. Her thick brown hair was somewhat wild, and whilst she was attractive, her face was flushed and she looked tired. They shook hands and told their stories. Well, Seeing as we're all in the same boat, Steve said, I suggest we put our heads together and find the nutter behind all this. And when that's done dash, he rubbed his hands together gleefully, I'm gonna kick his ass. Ian and Robert stood looking at Matthew's motionless body. They'd been doing that for several minutes, and Ian, despite some sadness at Matthew's demise, decided it was time to move on. Come on, Ian tried to console the other teenager. He's dead, it's over for him. I suggest we try and find our own salvation. We don't know he's dead, Robert objected desperately, have you felt for a pulse? He moved toward the body. No. Ian stopped him. He won't be nice to look at. Thank you very much. Matthew cried, leaping to his feet. 
you're not exactly a male model, yourself. Matt. Ian cried, unexpectedly delighted. We thought you were dead, Robert told him, quickly wiping away any hint of tears. Oh, I used my powers to stop the beams actually hitting me, Matthew said dismissively. Then why the dramatic collapse? Ian demanded. Matthew grinned. Just wondered if you cared, that's all. Ian sighed. But he had to admit, Matthew's sense of humor, warped though it may be, was very infectious. The two robots, imaginatively named Banix 1 and Banix 2, were operational. Dr. X Banix watched in delight as they moved exactly according to his instructions. Chief Marnode entered. I thought you said these two weren't operational? What if I did? Banix snarled. Landing on Aaron is imminent, Marnode told him. After we have dealt with the Badian, we will then be dealing with you. Look. Ian pointed. In the distance was a huge castle, just looming over the horizon. Ah, Matthew smiled. Now we're getting somewhere. Come on you two, hold on to me. What for? Ian looked horrified at the very idea. Now I can see it I can teleport us there. Idiot, Matthew retorted. If I didn't even know where we were going, I couldn't, now could I? Now come on. Matthew concentrated as Ian and Robert grabbed onto his arms. The threesome vanished. Steve, Philip and Sarah heard sobbing and, turning a corridor, saw Scott on the floor, crying. Steve helped him to his feet. You all right? He grunted. Scott wiped his eyes. Someone's been playing games with my mind. Making me see dead people, like my mom. This bastard is mean, Steve grinned appreciatively. Gonna be fun filling him with lead. Oh my, Sarah sighed wearily. What a nutter. Steve glared at her. Watch it, Missy. Ooh. Sarah grimaced. I'm doably frightened of you. She hid behind Philip. Pee pee please protect me. Philip laughed at his sibling's sarcasm. Nice one, sis. There was a whooshing sound and Ian, Matthew and Robert appeared out of nowhere in the corridor. Steve went for his gun, but Ian kicked it away. I'm sick of people doing that. Steve groaned. I suspect we're all in the same boat, Ian began confidently. So I think if we joined forces, with me as leader of course, we could teach someone a lesson or two. They stared at him open-mouthed. Piss off. Was just one of the responses. Julius stared at his monitor malevolently. He didn't like the idea of these people getting together at all, and now his monitor had gone dead. Julius chewed at his fingernails, wondering if he had bitten off more than he could swallow, and dreading what his enemies might be planning. His enemies were bombarding each other with insults, mostly directed at Ian. Me work for a Ponzi prince? Steve grunted. You've got to be bloody joking. Ian tried to calm his audience. I didn't mean work for me. I meant us all help each other. Steve nodded. That's better. With me in charge, Ian finished. The insults began again. The Assessor's warship sped sleekly toward Aaron. Entering Aaron atmosphere, Marnode spoke crisply. Arrival imminent. Excellent, High Commander Ragan's voice crackled slightly through the communicator, and remember, Marnode, Julius is to be caught and held until you reach Assessis, where I will personally dispose of him. You or any of your men kill him, or let him escape, and I'll execute you and your entire squadron in his place. Understood? Yes, sir, Marnode swallowed. Good. Out. Sighing, Marno turned in his seat, to face a grinning Dr. X Bannix. Problems? Bannix smiled slyly. The warship flew on. Chapter 6 Ian had finally calmed down his fellow victims, although there were still some rebellious mutterings, mainly from Steve. Philip and Scott didn't seem to mind much either way. 
Matthew and Robert were watching in detached amusement, and Sarah seemed to be hanging on Ian's every word. Right then, Ian continued, Now it's all settled and I'm in charge, I suggest. Suggest? Steve scoffed. You mean you order? I suggest, Ian carried on regardless, that we try to get out of this mess. Matthew applauded. Good thinking, he commented sarcastically. Julius was watching the news again, although the presenter's comments weren't instilling him with confidence. The Assessis warship will land on Aaron in two or three minutes' time, etc. I think, Julius commented shrewdly to no one in particular, that it's time I left Aaron to the Aarons. There was a whoosh of errand. Julius turned to face Matthew, Ian, and the others. Julius. Ian snarled. I might have known. He's just like Ian, Sarah pointed out rather unnecessarily. Apart from that rather nasty scar on your left cheek, right Jules? Ian mocked. I gave him that on our last encounter. Julius snarled. Watch it, brother dearest. Your supreme arrogance didn't do you much good last time, did it? You do enjoy talking rubbish, don't you? Ian smiled. If I remember correctly, it wasn't me that ran off at the sight of a tank and left an entire Assessian platoon to be slaughtered, was it? Julius scowled, reminded of his cowardice. What a wimp! Steve complained. And this is our supervillain. I could take on this powder puff blindfolded, crippled, and with two hands tied behind my back. Well, Julius smiled. It's been terribly nice chatting to you all, but, must dash. He ran for the inner door. Oh no you don't. Philip brought Julius to the floor, struggling viciously. Julius kicked Philip in the face, knocking him back, only to be knocked out by a karate chop from Sarah. Ian moved to his brother but recoiled as the inner door opened and Dr. Bannix's two robots stepped out. With one hand. Bannix won through Sarah across the room. Bannix two knocked Ian to the floor. This gets tedious, Matthew yawned, raising his arms. Bannix one smashed him in the face, sending him to the floor. Scott dived forward and headbutted Bannix two. It had no effect whatsoever on the robot and Scott collapsed, unconscious. Julius crawled quietly along the floor but the two Bannixes pushed past the others and grabbed each of his arms, preparing to pull him apart. No! Ian cried, not like that. He pulled out a strange-looking device. What are you doing? A recovering Scott demanded. Ian fired at Bannix one. It released Julius and went flailing around the room, sparking, eventually coming to rest on the floor. It's an electroshock gun, Ian said, reloading with another battery as Bannix II attempted to kill Julius single-handed. I use it on Zacharia to play havoc with the palace's computers. It shorts them out. Ian fired, but the robot kept on throttling Julius. Ian fired six more times. The robot released Julius and, sparking, headed for Ian. Steve fired his machine gun until it had run out of bullets, to no avail. The robot reached Ian, grabbed him by the throat, and squeezed, causing the teenager to gasp for breath, choking as it tightened its grip. No! Screaming, Sarah ran at the thing, only to have herself knocked aside without disturbing its grip. Matthew frowned. Oh, get off him, he murmured wearily blasting Bannix too to the far side of the room. Come on, Ian gasped. They followed him to the door, and a new enemy stepped through it. Dr. X Bannix raised an odd-looking gun. So you're Prince Ian, he rasped. I've always wanted to try this on a person, and royalty, no less. What is it? Ian gasped. This device reverses the polarity of the neutron flow in machines. Let's see what effect it has on people, shall we? Behind Ian, Bannix too climbed to its feet and lurched toward the teenager, hands raised in a strangling motion. Who knows, maybe it will send you insane or something, 
Dr. X panics chuckled. Two bad Ians, what a thought. He fired. Ian dived to the floor. The energy charge struck Banax too. Without changing its course, the robot grabbed its master and began to throttle the life out of him. Die, it spoke for the first time, evil must die. And Dr. X Banax, scientific genius and evil mastermind extraordinaire, died horribly at the hands of his own creation. Come on, Ian urged the others. The robot grabbed him. Please, Banix said, let me join you. Ian stared at it and realized it was more than just a tool for good, it was a person. Very well, he said slowly. We must hurry, Banix urged. Assess's soldiers are here. My former master wished the bad Ian dead so as to ruin Chief Marnod, they want him alive. Sarah looked around. Where is the bad Ian? Ian smiled. He'll be long gone. Come on. They ran through the door into a hangar where a spacecraft stood waiting. That's Julius' escape route, Ian smiled grimly. Now it's ours. They climbed aboard. Robert and Steve took the controls. Get back in the passenger section, Steve shouted. The engines roared and, swiftly and smoothly, the ship flew from the hangar and into the blue sky. Chief Marnode had just left the warship when he saw the craft fly off into space. There was no way they could catch it. Half the crew had already disembarked and by the time they were back on the craft the bad Ian's ship would be long gone. He knew he had failed, and he knew what failure would mean back on Assessis. Drawing his weapon, Marnode shoved the gun in his mouth and decorated the ground with his brains. Chapter 7 The craft had just left Aaron's atmosphere. Exhausted, almost everyone was sleeping in the passenger section, the lights down. All except two. Robert was in the cockpit, surveying the flight, when Julius attacked him from behind. Robert had no time to cry out, and virtually no time to struggle before he was lying unconscious on the floor. Julius chuckled. These imbeciles had thought his plan had been for them, no, they were just for fun, something for his hired mercenaries, still down on Aaron, to do, an added bonus. While he hadn't been expecting them quite so soon, it had been a cessus he had been after all along, he'd wanted to send them a message, to leave him alone, or they'd regret it. All over Aaron, massive thermonuclear warheads with the potential for cracking open the planet like an egg were waiting. Waiting for one signal to detonate and destroy everything. Julius pushed a button. Bye, by Aaron. The planet Aaron exploded, shattering its remains into fragments of debris that scattered all over the universe. Julius was encased in a spacesuit. And now, he cackled, I will destroy this ship and this newly formed Ian's gang. He typed in the password on the ship's computer. The screen flashed. Ignition imminent. Insert key for detonation. To abort press A. Julius took out a key. Ian lunged for him. The key clattered onto the floor as Ian punched his brother repeatedly, until Julius buckled under his onslaught. One final punch sent the villain to the floor and into oblivion. Ian punched A on the keyboard. The screen flashed. Self-destruct aborted. Julius grabbed the key, dived to his feet, threw Ian from the cockpit, and pressed a button. The door slid shut and locked. Julius cackled and typed in the password. The screen flashed. Ignition imminent. Insert key for detonation. To abort press A. Not likely, Julius said vehemently. He checked the scanner, but the debris from Aaron was still flying. Not yet, he chuckled, or I'll be turned into sushi. Ian blasted the door down and, as Julius turned in shock, he fired again, disintegrating the key. Ian moved in and threw his twin into the airlock, locking the inner door. No. Julius pleaded. You can't. Oh? Ian sneered. Why not? The debris from Aaron is still flying. I'll be torn in half the moment I'm out there. 
Julius pleaded. You destroyed an entire planet, Ian snarled. If that planet then destroys you, sounds like poetic justice to me. His finger jabbed down on a button. The airlock opened and, with a terrified scream, the bad Ian was sucked from the ship. Ian closed the airlock. Sarah entered curiously. What's all the noise about? My brother and I were having a friendly chat, Ian told her. But he had to leave. He had an appointment with a few thousand pieces of rock. Sarah raised her eyebrows. Ian entered the passenger section. Okay everyone, he began, I know a few of you didn't like me at first, and I admit I can be a bit presumptuous. But enough. We've done well. We've banded together and outwitted both the bad Ian and an entire Assessis warship. I know the delegates have signed you all up to be in Ian's gang already anyway, but if any of you dislike the idea so much, raise your hands and you don't have to do it. I'll scrap the whole idea. Just raise your hands. Strangely enough, no one did. Mind you, they were all asleep. Excerpt from Assessis News Report High Commander Ragan is reported to be disappointed with the warship's progress on Aaron, and is reviewing Chief Marnode's career possibilities.